We're so grateful to have him join us for this event. So to introduce Mark, please welcome Betsy Evans from the Department of Linguistics at UW. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you Mark Lieberman. Many of you may know him already, but for those of you who do not, he is the Christopher H. Brown Distinguished Professor of Linguistics in the Department of Linguistics and Professor in Computer and Information Sciences at the University of Pennsylvania. He is also founder and director of the Linguistic Data Consortium uh, and co-editor of the Annual Review of Linguistics. Um, his recent research has focused on corpus-based methods with applications to legal, medical, educational, and political analysis and linguistic theory. So his talk today is titled Historical Trends in English Sentence Length and Syntactic Complexity. So please welcome me in joining Professor Mark Lieberman. Okay, I hope you can see my screen. And I apologize that I can't be there with you in person. Uh, and I warn you in advance that this talk will be more of an advertisement for an opportunity than a presentation of a finished project. But uh, without further excuses, let me get started. Just uh, checking the, the uh, chat looks like Things here are working. Um, please uh, send me a message if you cannot hear me. Okay, seems to be fixed. Sorry for the delay. So it's easy to perceive clear historical trends in the length of sentences and the depth of clausal embedding in published English text. And those perceptions can easily be varied quantitatively. Or can they? Perhaps my title should be Historical Trends in English Punctuation Practices or Historical Trends in English Conjunctions and Discourse Markers. The answer to these questions depends on several prior questions. What is a sentence? What's the boundary between syntactic structure and discourse structure? How is message structure encoded in speech, spontaneous or rehearsed? versus in text. This presentation will survey the issues, look at some data, and suggest some answers or at least some fruitful directions for future work. Uh, illustrating the obvious, older texts in English tend to have longer sentences with greater depth of syntactic and conceptual embedding. Since different genres and styles also make a difference, let's start with a simple case the inaugural addresses of American presidents. This is the first paragraph of George Washington's inaugural address in 1789, and I will not read the whole thing. You can see there are a lot of words in it, and if we just look at the first sentence or so, you can see that it is the sentences are long and complex. Among the vicissitudes in incident to life, no event could have filled me with greater anxieties than that of which the notification was transmitted by your order and received on the 14th day of the present month. On the one hand, I was summoned by my country, whose voice I can never hear but with veneration and love, from a retreat which I had chosen with the fondest predilection and in my flattering hopes with an immutable decision as the asylum of my declining years, a retreat which was rendered every day, blah, 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 and so on. Here are the first two paragraphs of George W. Bush's inaugural address in 2005. On this day, prescribed by law and marked by ceremony, we celebrate the durable wisdom of our constitution and recall the deep commitments that unite our country. I am grateful for the honor of this hour, mindful of the consequential times in which we live and determined to fulfill the oath that I have sworn and you have witnessed. If we go through the inaugural address, the texts of the inaugural addresses and measure the length of each sentence and take the average, we get a graph that looks like this, showing mean sentence lengths from George Washington through G.W. Bush. This was something I did 
probably back in 2006 or so, which is why it only went to 2005, you can see that there seems to be a tendency for things to kind of asymptote out toward the bottom. And indeed that has continued because after all, if you were to, if you were to fit a line to the um, points up to around 1950 and continue it, pretty soon the average sentence duration would be negative. Now there's a longer term trend Here's a sample of novels and novel-like works over three and a half centuries. And uh, it, they're only 70, I've only, I only did this for 75 works, but you can see they were chosen really literally at random. And you can see that there's a strong tendency with some notable variants here and there um, for the average length of sentences to decrease. And here are the top five New York Times bestsellers per year from 1933 to 2020. Um, there's again some variation, but again, there's a clear um, statistically significant gradual declining trend, maybe with a bit of a tendency toward asymptoting as it obviously must do because um, with the best will in the world, it's not really possible to produce a novel with a mean sentence length that's below zero. Of course, there's a lot of variation, but the same gradual ten trend is visible in a larger collection over the same time period, rather than taking averages and including a much larger collection of novels, each point represents the mean sentence length in one work. Um, in this case, it's 1,114 novels from 1933 to 2020. And again, um, you can see a statistical trend, although there's an enormous amount of variation. Now, sentences in older English language texts are not only on average longer, they're also on average deeper. So here's a 34 word sentence from George Washington in, in 1789. Remember that the average length in, in that speech was 60. So this is not unusually long. And <clears throat> I've run it through a parser, which I believe has gotten, in this case, all of the um, structures correct. And in this parse, the deepest, the deepest word is 17 levels down from the root. Here's a 19 word sentence from George W. Bush in 2005 um, and its parse. And in this parse, the deepest word is just 10 levels down. Now, one might argue there, there are a lot of different ways to embed. There are a lot of different kinds of um, structures that can lead to a longer path to the root of the clause. So one might think that embedding of finite clauses, that is tense clauses, is a key feature. So I analyzed the levels of finite clauses in each inaugural. Um, so the sentence that we saw before, in this conflict of emotions, all I dare aver is that has been my faithful duty to collect my faithful study to collect my duty from a just appreciation of every circumstance by which it might be affected. So there's three levels of um, tensed clauses. Whereas um, in George Bush's case, there's only two. And then I counted the number and proportion of words in each text at each level of embedding. So here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten at level zero, and then some number at level one, and one, two, three, four, five, six at level two, and so on. And uh, here are illustrative results for four of the inaugural addresses, though I have the numbers for all of them. So in George Washington's speech, the mean sentence length was 60 words. Um, only 44% of those words were in the matrix clause and for nearly 40% were one level down, 14% were two, level down, two levels down, 3% were three levels down. Uh, by the time we get to um, Donald Trump in 2017, um, nearly 90% of all of the words are in the matrix clause. 12% are one level down, whoops, and only 1% are 
are two levels down and there are none at three and four and the mean sentence length is 15. But deeper, that is more embedding clausal, clausal or otherwise, it's not the only way that sentences can get longer. And I'm going, now going to introduce two words that you're probably familiar with. One is hypotaxis, which is from Greek hypo below and taxis placing, which mean, and it means the syntactic subordination of one clause or construction to another. And the other is parataxis from para beside and taxis placing. This is the placing of propositions or clauses one after another without indicating by connecting words, the relation of coordination or subordination between them, as in tell me, how are you? Or I came, I saw, I conquered. This is actually a, a definition taken from the Oxford English Dictionary. For present purposes, I'm going to use or perhaps misuse the term parataxis in a slightly different way to include stringing things together with conjunctions as well as without conjunctions, because the point is that they're parallel structures rather than subordinated structures. So I came, I saw, I conquered. I came, I saw, and I conquered are both examples of parataxis in this sense, since there's no explicit syntactic subordination. But this distinction leaves open a crucial question or rather opens the door to a large set of interesting but difficult questions. Is a paratactic sequence just one thing after another, whether within a sentence or across sentences? And I put sentence in scare quotes here because as we'll see the question of where we should draw the boundaries is not always crystal clear. Or is there an implicit hierarchical relationship with specific semantic or discourse structural content in at least some of these paratac paratactic sequences. This is not a new question. If we look at the OED's entry, the Oxford English Dictionary's entry for the noun period, um, one of the senses is in rhetoric, a grammatically complete sentence, especially one made up of a number of clauses formed into a balanced or rhythmical whole or more generally, a series of sentences seen as a linguistic unit. So maybe the relevant structure should be rhetorical sequences, whether or not they contain internal punctuational periods in the typographical sense of that word. And even if the units are divided by punctuational periods, there are, abound there are abundant textual variants, as we'll see. And no matter how we answer these questions, it should not be surprising that like pretty much everything else in language, they get tangled up in various kinds of social stereotypes, for example, gender stereotypes. Here's something from Otto Jesperson's 1922 book, Language, Nature, Origin, it's Nature, Development and Origin, chapter 13, The Woman. In learned terminology, we may say that men are fond of hypotaxis and women of parataxis. Or we may use the simile that a male period is often like a set of Chinese boxes, one within the other, where, while a female period is like a set of pearls joined together on a string of ands and similar words. Now, um, Jesperson was a, a person, a man of his time with the sexist attitudes and misogynistic attitudes of, of the 1920s, I suppose. But he's not the only one who has had similar thoughts. So Ursula K. Le Guin's wonderful 1953 essay, Introducing Myself, as published in her collection, The Wave in the Mind, includes this paragraph. What it comes down to, I guess, is that I am just not manly, like Ernest Hemingway was manly. The beard and the guns and the wives and the little short sentences, I do try. I have this sort of beardoid thing that keeps trying to grow nine or 10 hairs on my chin, sometimes even more. But what do I do with the hairs? I tweak them out. Would a man do that? Men don't tweak, men shave. Anyhow, white men shave being hairy and I have even less choice about being white or not than I do about being a man or not. I am white, whether I like being white or not, the doctors can do nothing for me. But I do my best not to be white, I guess, under the circumstances since I don't shave, I tweak but it doesn't mean anything because I don't really have a real beard that amounts to anything. And I don't have a gun and I don't have even one wife. And my sentences tend to go on and on and on with all this syntax in them. 
Ernest Hemingway would have died rather than have syntax or semicolons. I use a whole lot of half-assed semicolons. There was one of them just now. That was a semicolon after semicolons and another one after now. But in fact, the distribution of sentence lengths in her essay collection that that essay comes from, The Wave in the Mind, is almost identical to the distribution in Hemingway's memoir, A Movable Feast. Um, we've got here quantiles um, from five, the fifth quantile to the 95th quantile and the sentence length in words for Ursula K. Le Guin's book and for Hemingway's book. And you can see that quantile by quantile, they're actually almost identically the same. So it's not just that the mean and median are similar, um, but the whole distribution is almost exactly the same. This is really a surprising coincidence, but it's not just a general fact about texts. Authors can obviously use longer sentences. Here's the distribution of sentence lengths in green in Charles Dickens' American Notes, which is also a sort of memoir-like um, piece of writing. And you can see that the mean and the median and indeed the whole distribution um, tend toward longer sentences. Now, Le Guin was right about the semicolons, at least in comparison to Hemingway. The relative frequency of semicolons in her essay collection, The Wave in the Mind, is more than four times greater than the semicolon frequency in Hemingway's memoir, A Movable Feast. Um, she, she uses 70, about 79 semicolons per 100,000 characters, whereas Hemingway only used about 18. There's definitely a secular trend in semicolon frequency. Again, for the same 75 words, works from 1651 to 2013, the frequency of semicolons is notably decreasing over the years, again, with a good deal of variation around the trend line. And semi over that period, semicolon frequency correlates with sentence length. So this is the frequency of semicolons, and this is the mean sentence length. And it's sort of obvious why that would be true, because one of the ways to make sentences longer, and there should be scare quotes about sentences here, is to put, take a couple of sentences and put them together with a semicolon in the middle. Um, and you can see the same kind of correlation in the larger, more recent sample that I showed before. There are fewer works with more semicolons, but in general, there's a trend toward longer sentence length with more semicolons. But does it, what does this have anything to do with gender? Well, I could show a graph, but here's a table. And I've just taken a sample of novels um, over, the, over the time from um, Pamela in 1740. Um, well, A Wave in the Mind is essays, not novels. Um, that was, uh, I think, 2023 um, or something like that. I can't quite see because the pictures are in front of it. But in any event, um, the male, the ones with male authors are in blue, the ones with female authors are in red, and you can see that there are some female authors with very few semicolons, Murder in, in the, on the Orient Express, Agatha Christie has a third, only a third of Hemingway's rate of semicolon usage. Um, there are other, and there are males, male authors um, like The Great Gatsby, I'm sorry, like The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, um, that have quite a few. Um, now, semicolons aside, the fact that we have a stereotype, that many people have a stereotype of Hemingway being a writer who produces short sentences, it's actually a bit of a mystery because his sentences are not actually all that short. His writings are actually a, generally a bit behind the sentence length tre trend. There's the point for a movable feast um, and you can see that compared to other works of that same time period, it's not leading the way, let's say. And if we were to look at his other works, we would see a similar thing, that they're generally a little bit above the trend line. It has occurred to me, among the other things that might be going on, it, it is true that he tends to be paratactic rather than hypotactic, but maybe lexical diversity, the rate of lexical display is playing a role. So here are type token plots, if you're not familiar with those, for four works by Thomas Pynchon, Bleeding Edge, V, Inherent Vice, and The Crying of Lot 49, and four works by Hemingway, 
a movable feast for whom the bell tolls, the sun also rises, the old man in the sea. And what, what we've done here, what I've done here, is to count the number of word tokens. So every time a word occurs in the text, we're incrementing this number as long as the text continues. And then we're asking how many different words are there for that many tokens. And you can see that there, that in general, all of these curves are concave downwards. They're, they're, they, the, the rate of growth decreases, um, but they're very, very different trajectories. And in particular, um, Pynchon is displaying his vocabulary at a much, much faster rate than Hemingway is. Um, and um, in all the authors that I've checked, Pynchon wins the race, um, wins the type token race, and Hemingway comes in last, which is why I've chosen those two authors. But um, what about Ursula K. Le Guin? Well, the wave in the mind turns out to be right up there with Pynchon. So even though her sentences are the same length as Hemingway, her rate of le her, her re lexical bling, her rate of lexical display um, is more like Pynchon's. And so maybe that's influencing people's perception of sentence length judgment. But again, gender doesn't really seem to be crucial. Anyway, this talk is not about lexical diversity. So let's get back to the length and structure of, textical, of, te of textual units. Um, beyond mere sentence length and the paratactic hypotactic distinction, there are obviously a lot of other ways, a lot of other relevant dimensions of stylistic variation in structure, never mind stylistic variation in word choice and things of that kind. There's the amount and type of within clause modification. Um, how many adjectives and adverbs are there? And are the, um, ad, is the adverbial modification by single words or by prepositional phrases or what? To what extent do you have subordinate versus parallel clauses and sentences? The number and length and distribution of parentheticals and appositives, um, the use of pronouns as opposed to definite descriptions in making reference and so on and so on. We could list many, many things. And these dimensions obviously vary with many things other than historical time, the genre or type of work, the author and presumably the editors, the intended audience and so on. But all these other dimensions aside, sentence length is an interesting variable, a relevant variable and one which is maybe more widely used than it should be. For example, it's central to the, the famous or infamous flesh Kincaid grade level measure. So 50 years ago, the US Navy was concerned that its technical manuals and instructional materials might be too difficult for recruits to understand. So they contracted with J. Peter Kincaid to update Rudolf Flesch's 1948 measure of readability, which was based on the plausible intuition that longer words and longer sentences are harder to read, other things equal. Now, this being the middle of the previous century, computers were not available. Everything was pencil and paper or at most electromechanical calculators. And so Flesch and Kincaid counted words, sentences, and syllables in a collection of graded educational materials. And then they used multiple regression to estimate readability and grade level. And this is Kincaid's resulting grade level formula. You can see it's a linear equation. It's 0.39 times the average sentence length in words plus 11.8 times the average word length in syllables minus 15.59. But sentence length depends on how a discourse is divided into sentences. And that's a process that has many layers of orthographic, authorial, and editorial choice. So, and this has been true from the beginning of printing. Here are the first two sentences of John Knox's infamous screed, the first blast of the trumpet against the monstrous regimen of women, transcribed from the original 1558 edition. 
the, in this version, the first sentence in red is 90 words long, and the second one is 28 words long. Long sentences, obviously, 15, you know, 16th century. Here's a 17th century edition published about a, a century later in which those two sentences are combined with a comma in place of the period, making one sentence of 118 words. That is this period here, this comma rather, was a period in the original publication, but some editor or typographer changed it to a comma in the edition a century later. We tend to, all the same, we tend to see the division of written text into sentences as given. And everybody measures sentences by saying, all right, you know, there's, leave, we're going to leave out the periods that are in initials and the periods that are in the, our decimal points. And we're just going to pay attention to the periods that end sentences. And every time we see one of those or an exclamation point or a question mark, we'll say that there's a question. I'm sorry, we'll say that there's a sentence, more or less. But in spontaneous speech, the division into sentences depends on transcribers' choices, which can and do vary a lot. And transcribers are not really given the kind of respect in this, in this sort of matter that authors and editors have. And this has some curious, this can have curious results. So here's an article from the Boston Globe in 2015 for presidential hopefuls, simpler language resonates. Trump tops GOP field while talking to voters at fourth grade level. When Donald Trump announced his presidential campaign, he decried the lack of intelligence of elected officials in characteristically blunt terms. How stupid are our leaders, he said. How stupid are they? But his own, with his own choice of words and his short, simple sentences, Trump's speech could have been comprehended by a fourth grader. Yes, a fourth grader. The Globe reviewed the language used by 19 presidential candidates, Democrats and Republicans in speeches announcing their campaigns for the 2016 presidential election. The review using a common algorithm called the French, the Flesh Kincaid readability test, actually it Flesh's readability test and Flesh and Kincaid's grade level test in any event, <clears throat> which crunches word choice and sentence structure and spits out grade level rankings produced some striking results. So anyway, here's a sample from the cited speech um, by Trump, starting with the version of the transcript that the Globe used and calculating grade level based on versions with the same word sequence, but slightly different punctuation. It's coming from Mexico. It's coming from all over South and Latin America. And it's coming probably, probably from the Middle East, but we don't know because we have no protection. We have no competence. We don't know what's happening. And it's got to stop and it's got to stop fast. So if you plug that into the flesh Kincaid algorithm, it comes out as grade level 4.4. Suppose we, we, we repunctuate it a little bit. It's coming from more than Mexico. It's coming from all over South and Latin America, and it's coming probably, probably from the Middle East. We don't know because we have no protection. We have no competence. We don't know what's happening. And it's got to stop, and it's got to stop fast. That's grade level 8.5. Here's another version. It's coming from more than Mexico. It's coming from all over South and Latin America, and it's coming probably, probably from the Middle East, but we don't know because we have no protection. We have no competence. We don't know what's happening. And it's got to stop, and it's got to stop fast. That's grade level 12.5. So which of these is correct in terms of the division into sentences? Well, you tell me. Now, there are two distinct questions about paratactic sequences like those. One is, what are the units? you know, how do we divide it into quote unquote sentences? And, but second, even given that division, what is the structure? So maybe there are two sentences as in the tra transcript, which broke at silent pauses, because we don't know, because we have no protection and we have no competence, we don't know what's happening. But there could be three or four or only one in the exam as in the version provided below there. No matter how we punctuate it, the meaning is the same. And presumably, the syntax guiding the semantics ought to reflect that. And this comes up in cases where everybody agrees about the punctuation. For example, there's the construction that Barbara Partee calls baseball conditionals. 
because they often occur in quotations from baseball players, managers, and coaches. He could have been a little rusty early on, and then the inning he gave up four runs, I think he kind of lost his composure a little bit, Orioles manager Sam Perloso said. He just did a little damage control in that situation, we're okay. And the, in boldface here is the baseball conditional. And it's a conditional in the sense that what he means is, if he just did a little damage control in that situation, we would have been okay. Here's another example. A year ago, we don't win tonight. It's a different mentality in our clubhouse now. Similar paratactic constructions are very common in informal English. Um, the uh, lower socioeconomic um, status characters in Elmore Leonard's novels, it's about all they do. So here's a, here's a quote um, from his novel, La Brava. What are you having, huh? Do you ever see it? They take it out of the shell, you wouldn't eat it. Now, if we were to translate the last two sentences into sort of standard English, if you had ever seen a conch, when they take it out of the shell, you wouldn't eat it. So there's um, a temporal um, clause modifying if you had, you had ever seen a conch. Um, and then the whole thing is a conditional um, leading to the fourth sentence over there. Now, the, what, what the character actually said um, is divided into three clauses. Um, should we just string them together with the semantics to be inferred by discourse level processes? You ever see it? They take it out of the shell, you wouldn't need it. And what I, the X node that I've added here, connecting those three clauses and separating them from what precedes and what follows, it's actually another representational choice. I mean, when you have syntacticians would not ordinarily connect up sentences, separate sentences in a paragraph or across paragraphs of a discourse, they, they just take it one sentence at a time or conceivably the same sequence, the sequence should be given the same structure as the hypotactic version like this, with features on the nodes and links specifying their semantic relationships so that this sentence is a temporal modifier of this sentence and the whole thing here is a conditional clause leading to that conclusion. So in other words, is parataxis really covert hypotaxis, at least sometimes? This should remind us, those of us who know, have followed even from the outside, the recent history of linguistics, it should remind us of the great recursion debate. Um, quote from Chomsky, from Hauser, Chomsky and Fitch, 2002, we hypothesized that the faculty of language in the narrow sense only incur, includes recursion and is the only uniquely human component of the faculty of language. Dan Everett, um, starting in 2005, reacted against this based on a reanalysis of his previous analysis of the language of the Piraha, a tribe in the Amazon basin. Despite his assertion that they have no embedding, they have no recursion, in particular, they have no clausal embedding, he presents and discusses examples that he translates as, when I finish eating, I want to speak to you. If it rains, I will not go. I want the, chirk, the shirt that Chico sold. The woman wants to see you. He knows how to make arrows well. I said that Koi intends to leave and so on. These seem like transparent counterexamples to his claim that there is no embedding in this language. But basically his argument is that the Piraha are all like Elmore Leonard characters. They're semantically complex and examples in his analysis are paratactic sequences of units without any explicit syntactic relations among them. In my opinion, this situation poses a problem for all linguists. I think it's just as much of a problem for Dan Everett as it is for Noam Chomsky. If we deploy syntactic embedding and semantic relations to describe baseball conditionals, Elmore Leonard's dialogue, Donald Trump's speeches, the um, uh, constructions in the language of the Piraha, 
and the paratactic aspects of much ordinary English, including the way that all of us talk much of the time, can we rationally avoid the, the responsibility to provide a syntactic analysis for larger scale discourse structures? And if we do that, can we stop at local rhetorical relations like exemplification, concession, generalization, which can apply across pairs of sentences, whether within sentences or across sentences? Or do we need to give a syntactic account of the relationships among paragraph and chapter size discourse chunks? When a novel has a flashback, is that chunk syntactically related somehow um, as a structure? Well, people who do discourse analysis or narrative analysis would say, well, yes, there is a structure there, but syntacticians do not go that way and are, would argue, I think, that they shouldn't go that way. Okay, well, um, I'm going to give some tentative conclusions. Um, English language text definitely exhibits long-term trends in sentence length and complexity, but to some extent, these trends reflect changes in punctuational style. And there are many relevant features besides sentence length that remain to be explored, including the balance between hypotaxis and parataxis, Furthermore, the syntax of paratactic sequences is an issue um, both within sentences and also across quote unquote sentences, whatever we, however we decide to divide sentences up. And as a result, the boundary between syntax and discourse is unclear in interesting ways. And this leaves us with some questions as well. Why does this trend toward shorter sentences exist? One possibility is that it's the declining influence of Latin and Greek models. A few hundred years ago, and even as recently as 100 years ago, educated people had to learn from reading Cicero and um, Caesar and um, so forth. Um, and those works tended to have long, complex sentences. There, you could argue that there's a general trend towards simpler and plainer style, not only in writing, um, but also, for example, in architecture and in clothing and in decoration more generally. Well, some aspects of clothing, let's say. Or is it just random cultural evolution? What are the effects of devices and media? There was a time when most text was written with a quill pen or with a pencil. Um, then there's the effect of printing. Um, there's the um, what difference does it make when people are typing or when people expect things to be read on computer screens or on smartphone screens. Those presumably have effects. Um, trying to read the, the sentences of George Washington's inaugural address on a smartphone would be hard. What about trends in other languages? In particular, based on very little evidence, it seems to me that the history of French is somewhat different. And I should note before closing that the 1933 to 2020 text collection, which I showed a couple of plots from, comes from work in progress with Angela Duckworth, Lyle Unger, Benjamin Manning, and Jordan Ellenberg. So that's the end of my presentation. I hope I have lasted about the right amount of time and uh, left time for questions. Hi, Mark, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Great, we're gonna try to switch you over to the Q&A mic and I'll ask you this question again. If you said something on the Q&A mic, I did not hear it. Hello, hello. Can that you I hear heard. Me? Great. So for people who are viewing on Zoom, you can put a question into the Q&A box. For people who are here in the room, of which there are quite a few of you, I don't know, if Mark, if you can see that very well, um, we will be using this microphone. 
speak into it like it's a tin can attached to a rope um, or like you are a rock star, you're at karaoke. Do not be tempted to let it slide like this. As you can see, it no longer picks up your voice. So Caitlin Posa will be handing this around. Colette will read questions from the Q&A box so that Mark, you can hear them. Mark, you also have access to them written, but our audience in room does not. So with that, I'll hand it over to Caitlin Postal to hand around and we welcome questions. Great, there are some. <laughs> Hi, Mark. This is Dennis Preston. Uh, thanks for that presentation. It was very, very interesting. Uh, and I hate to say that everything that ever that's good about linguistics comes out of Pennsylvania, but uh, aren't these the same questions that Zelig Harris dealt with when he stopped the, the notion of long component at phonology, morphology, and syntax, but said very clearly that long component analysis could be very productive when we go beyond the sentence boundary. So I think uh, uh, he, he wasn't just uh, Noam's dissertation director. <laughs> he, was, he was a good linguist on his own. And I think he saw more formal and more empirical ways of solving some of the, not solving, but putting at issue some of the very same things that you brought up. An excellent point. And I should go back. I, I'm aware of that work. And I should go back and extract some appropriate quotes. Um, Harris's notion of quote unquote transformation um, basically had to do with um, patterns of relationship um, observable in text corpora, um, both within and across sentences, the location of periods and exclamation points and question marks um, didn't interrupt that process for, for him. Um, he, to the extent that he was able to do anything with computers, they were relatively primitive computers with relatively small amounts of text. And so he really couldn't um, carry his ideas through um, as far as he would have liked to see them go. Um, but the, the, the point is very well taken. Other questions? Hello. Bridget Drinka. Um, that was fascinating. There is so much in there. It's just really exciting and thought provoking. But you know, you ended with one comment about French operating differently. And I, that's just, I would just like to know how does it operate differently? Why does it operate differently? Just could you explain that in a little more detail? Well, I have very, very little data, um, but I've looked at um, some you know, uh, earlier writers like Rousseau um, and um, other, you know, the encyclopedists and so on. And my impression is that they valued clarity above complexity. So their paragraphs, the distribution of paragraph lengths is relatively short. The distribution of sentence lengths is relatively short compared to um, English language authors of the same time period. Um, I'm reluctant to claim to make a very general claim because I've looked at maybe three French authors um, compared to dozens and dozens of English language authors. Um, but I'm, I'm, I get the impression that the, uh, that for whatever reason, um, the stylistic patterns across history may have been different. It's sort of on my to-do list to uh, go into this more fully, <clears throat> um, especially now that uh, um, the French National Library has uh, access to good electronic texts of lots of works from the last few hundred years. Um, next time I have a free week, I think I'll download a bunch of them and see what I can do with them. This is Stefan Lorenzo. Thank you for your talk. Uh, I think it's interesting that you show that there's sort of a, uh, the consequences of our presuppositions are, of course, vast. And maybe as linguists, we should think we should think a lot about remove that map. We should think a lot about whether we deal with 
written language where we have punctuation expressed in one way that we could reanalyze just like you you just showed us before and that there is an ambiguity about it that we need to integrate more yeah more completely than we've probably been doing it so far um well i so, started i'm sorry go ahead yeah so i was wondering would it um would you go so far that parataxis would be maybe would have a more important role than its given syntax well, let me say first that um, I started thinking about these problems again recently because we've been working with um, linguistic clinical applications of linguistic analysis. And one obvious, so there are things like the distribution of in speech of um, uh, speech segments versus silent segments. And there are things like rate of speech in syllables or words per minute. And there are things like the distribution of word frequencies and distribution of um, word uh, of predictability of you know, cross entropy of words and so on, distribution of different parts of speech. Um, but one obvious thing to look at is some kind of measure of syntactic complexity. And one obvious thing to try that people have have tried is sentence length, but of course that depends on how you divide things up into sentences. And in spoken language, that's very non-obvious, so it's kind of a non-starter. Um, and you, but so you want some other kind of idea about how things, um, uh, how to measure, and there there are other things that, that you can measure. Um, with respect to the second part of your question. Um, there, I think there's no doubt that spoken language tends to be more paratactic and less hypotactic in the superficial sense of having fewer explicit subordinators, um, although there certainly are some explicit subordinators. Um, Again, it correlates with formality, with degree of education, and so on. There's a reason why Elmore Leonard's lower socioeconomic status characters tend to speak in these um, almost completely, I mean, they, they basically speak like members of the Piraha tribe, um, according to Dan Everett's analysis. Um, but uh, this that leaves open the question of whether we really should be assembling those fragments into the semantic structures that were obviously intended, um, in which case we're back with, with a kind of hypotactic organization. And uh, I don't really have a clear answer to that. Okay, thank you. Um. Hello, Dr. Lieberman. My name is Sarah. Uh, my name is Sarah. Hello. I'm sorry if my question uh, is asking you to repeat yourself. Um, I don't think it is, but I, but I, it might be. So I apologize for that. Um, I was just thinking about your your data about President Trump um, and how he, if we just repunctuate his sentence, suddenly he's at a great twelve point five level, and yet um, when we listen to him speak, it doesn't come across as somebody who's speaking at a great twelve level. And um, I don't think it's just because his ideas are reprehensible or himself is reprehensible. I think it's the, the way he's using language as well. And so I was wondering um, what, else, what other, does it like, is that basically saying that the, the way that, that, or that formula is essentially not working very well in order to indicate the level of a sentence or is there uh, something else? Well, the formula, I mean, the formula comes from the middle of the 20th century, basically. And it was, you know, what they could do with what they had available to them now. If we were going to try to construct a readability index, I mean, it has the, it has the property that it doesn't even check that the material is in the language of the readers. So you put in a German text or a Spanish text or a Swahili text, um, and it, it will come out with some kind of grade level, um, which is not a, a good indication of um, at what level English student, English language students or American students would be able to read that text. Um, 
and and equally obviously you could construct something very subtle i mean many kinds of mathematical texts for example um, come out to be a low flesh kincaid grade level because they have lots of short quote unquote words namely algebraic variables um, and short sentences namely short equations and that doesn't mean that fourth graders can understand them um, so anyhow uh, you know, I, I agree that the, that one way or another, the flesh Kincaid um, grade level measure is an extremely crude approximation, and we ought ought to really be able to do much better. And in fact, there are ideas out there about how to do better. Um, in terms of the impression given by Donald Trump's speech, um, there are a couple things about his style that are really quite striking. One is that he repeats himself a lot. Uh, if you go to, if you do a type token plot of his um, his speeches, um, especially his spontaneous speeches, um, they're really, really shallow because he says almost everything two or three times. And so the same words are occurring again and again and again. Um, a second thing, and, and that undoubtedly is part of what gives the impression that his speeches are simple and, and easy to understand. Um, another thing that correlates with that, I think, is that he almost never uses filled pauses. Uh, his, his rate of ums and uhs is almost zero. Under some circumstances, if he's a little bit worried about what he's saying for a given audience, a few creep in. But it's quite common in his rally speeches, for example, for him to go on for long periods of time without a single filled pause, uh, which is quite unusual for any, even for, for skilled public speakers, and certainly unusual for politicians. And my guess is actually that those two features are connected, that, that at some point in his history, some teacher gave him a hard time for using filled pauses and as a way of avoiding it and also avoiding dead air, which is also embarrassing, he began simply repeating things um, two or three times. Uh, you, you, you probably saw in the section that I, uh, the, the small excerpt that I gave, that there are quite a few repetitions. So there's obviously more to be said about both his style and about what makes a particular discourse spoken or written harder or easier to understand for one kind of person or another. Um, but maybe that's a start. I have a couple of questions from the Zoom webinar. So you can see them, Mark, but I'm going to read them for the group. First one is, so do you see these trends in sentences slash units that have ambiguity of any kind? such as idiomatic phrases, or even phrases with lexical ambiguity? It's a very good question to which I don't know the answer. Um, of course, the boundary between quote unquote idiom and you know, fixed expression and common construction and so on is a kind of a permeable one, a kind of gradient one. Um, so there are, <clears throat> um, uh, some kinds of things like, I don't know, red herring, um, where the meaning of the whole is completely unpredictable from the meaning of the parts. And there are other examples like, uh, you know, strong T, um, which uh, um, it is a kind of a fixed expression, um, as uh, has been pointed out in the past you would probably say strong T and not powerful T. Um, but, uh, or if you said powerful T, you would mean something a little bit different. Um, uh, but nevertheless, the meaning of strong T or strong coffee is, is determinable or predictable or clo certainly closely related to its uh, semantic composition. Um, whether there are whether there's a tendency for fixed expressions to get shorter, I don't know. I mean, there, there's people have been um, making very short uh, um, 
idiomatic words, novel words, like, you know, mob from mobile vulgus, and so on for hundreds of years. And uh, people have also been um, spinning out longer uh, idioms or longer idiomatic expressions for hundreds of years. So it's a good question, and I don't have any answer other than somebody should look into it. Good project for a lexicographer. Great. Um, the next one says, have you come across anything about longer or shorter English sentences appearing in different places over time? For example, in Washington speech, was it more likely that a long sentence could start a speech or a paragraph, whereas now, might longer sentences be alternated more frequently with shorter ones? Another very good question, uh, to which again, unfortunately, I don't have much of an answer. Um, the, uh, um, the, the higher order distribution of uh, sentence lengths, um, and I actually have never looked at, I have looked at higher order distribution of speech segment durations in, um, uh, in narrative and in conversation. And they're def it's definitely um, not, so you could have a sort of, uh, um, first order distribution that says, all right, you have this distribution of speech segment durations and silent segment durations, and you reach into the speech segment urn and you pull one out, and you reach into the silent segment urn and you pull one out, and then you reach into the speech segment urn again, and so on. Um, or you could say, all right, there's once you've pulled out a speech segment of a certain length, that actually conditions the silent segment that follows. And then that also conditions the speech segment that follows. And it's very easy to show that indeed that kind of conditioning, that kind of higher order conditioning um, is statistically significant. Um, and it, 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 that plays a role in the so-called language model for what's called diarization, that is figuring out who spoke when, um, because you want to look at what the, the pattern of speech segment durations within and across conversational turns might be. So, but your question about um, uh, sort of higher order distribution of sentence durations and how that might change over time or how that might change in different styles or for different authors, wonderful question, uh, well worth looking into, easy to look into. Maybe two more. Okay. Um, I want to follow up one more time um, about the punctuation. I think that's something that like we at Shell understand. Many of us work in the English department, and so we, you know, we we, we do something to teach writing. So punctuation is something that some of us linguistically uh, look at as well, not just you know for writing purposes, but I think more general in linguistic part, I don't think punctuation plays a big role in anything. So I wonder, would you say that what you've shown us now about the index, is this just about the readability index, of the, the problem of that, or is this more a general problem that we should tackle, that we should include and appropriate punctuation if that's possible, at least for the writing, uh, for the written text? I think that's a very good question. I've just started a project with uh, um, a woman who's the head of the critical writing program at Penn, which is offers uh, uh, required writing seminars to Penn undergraduates. And uh, we've been discussing this very question. And one of the problems is that there are ways to use punctuation which are wrong according to the norms of contemporary written English, so-called comma splices, for example, um, and which will cause readability problems just because at least people who know the rules will say, wait a minute, you're not supposed to do that. Um, there are other cases where it could very well be that um, taking, uh, say, a parenthetical and setting it off with hyphens um, would actually improve readability. Or taking uh, uh, an assertion 
and a caveat and separating them with a semicolon might improve readability. I think one of the problems is that we don't actually have a lot of uh, empirical sort of psychological evidence. Um, and I think it would not be trivial to get that evidence because obviously the effect on readers is going to depend on who those readers are and what they're used to and what aspects, you know, what they already know about the content of the text and so on. Um, but still, my own belief is that just taking the units of a text and maximally dividing them up into quote unquote sentences is probably not the way to make things maximally readable. On the other hand, stringing them together with hyphens and colons and semicolons and commas into very, very long quote unquote sentences is also not a good way to make things readable. And uh, I think your the, a, a proper answer to your question um, would be uh, what's, you know, how can we give advice about what to do that can be assimilated um, relatively easily and applied relatively easily. And I, if I knew the answer to that, I would have more to say about it. Mark, one last question that I had about your data that had the chart of the 75 novels and the sentence length, and there was one outlier looming high above the others. And I found myself curious as to what novel that could be, but maybe you don't know. It was, there was one dot really high up. Yes, yes, I, and I know, um, but I, I'm forgetting. It's, oh, I know what it is. It's, uh, um, no, I'm, I'm drawing a blank. Um, it's the novel about a woman of pleasure. Oh, Clarissa? Uh, uh, is that? No, no, it's not Clarissa. It, the title of the novel is Name, colon, a woman of pleasure, I, I'm pretty sure. Fanny Hill? Fanny Hill, there you go. The yes. crowd got it. Thing. Why Fanny Hill is such an outlier in terms of sentence length, I don't remember, but that I'm pretty sure I, I was curious about that same point. And so I sorted the list by sentence length, and I think Fanny Hill came out on top. I love the blend of tech, right? So we have Mark here, he's 3,000 miles away, but we use the tech to like project images of trees behind him so that we can our, our conference animal brain can feel comfortable. And I'm holding a, a microphone that I'm instructed to use like a tin can foam. Like that was my instruction, right? So we sort of like, it's like our, our conference brains need layers to process the technology. So Mark, thank you for reaching across 3000 miles. We're so grateful that you joined us um, and we're so glad to have your talk. Thanks so much. Thanks for inviting me. I'm sorry again, I couldn't be there in person. Seattle's one of my favorite places. So now we have time. Now we have time for a reception. <laughs>